Good afternoon. Uh, it is a great pleasure to see you all here. Thank you for joining us, either on site or online. Uh, we are faced with uh, many challenges due to the spread of COVID 19. And also in Korea, uh, we are now in public space and we have uh, some people gathered here as well. Uh, so, as a moderator, I'm wearing this mask, so please excuse me for wearing the mask. And this session is about the current status and challenges of North Korea research in overseas. So representing each country, we have six, speak, six panelists, Dr. Hong from Korea and other panelists from uh, overseas. So each presenter, please limit your presentation to 15 minutes. And uh, I hope to hear about uh, the current status of North Korea studies in your respective country. And uh, on the program book, uh, we have uh, presenters and discussants. So the roles are divided. But uh, I realize that each person is from a different country. So I guess it will be a great opportunity for each of you to represent the predominant view or the overall status of North Korea studies in your respective country. And after, uh, I believe we will uh, be, in, uh, be into about 90 minutes once we done uh, listening to all of the panelists, and then we will have a more freestyle discussion. So I will introduce our speakers according to the names presented on the program book. First, um, Dr. Jenny Town. Please go ahead with your presentation. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Ministry of Unification and the Korea Association of North Korea Studies for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I'm disappointed that I can't be there in person as I miss the days when we could move about freely. Uh, who knew 2020 was going to be such a hot mess? Um, but I think the fact that it's 3 a.m. here in DC and I stayed up to join you for this conversation shows my dedication to this exchange. Um, and since it is 3 a.m. and this is the second to the last panel of your conference, I thought instead of talking about a specific um, country focus, uh, that I'd like to frame my discussion um, a little bit broader as the good, the bad, and the ugly of North Korea research in general. Um, what I see is the positive and negative trends in the field, as well as opportunities for working together to improve access and overall scholarship. North Korea is obviously, it's largely perceived as a black box. It's difficult to see inside, to know what's happening and how it functions. Um, but the information is there. It just takes greater effort and know-how to access it. At the same time, there's a sort of stigma to trying too hard to understand North Korea. It's an odd situation where those who try to understand the North Korean perspective and factor that into their research or policy analysis are often labeled as sympathizers rather than frankly, good researchers. Um, after all, how do you ever expect to have effective policies or conclusions if you don't try to understand how the subject sees itself? Um, but there's good news. The good news is uh, when it comes to North Korea, there's rising interest in learning more about it. Um, there's a growing number of scholars who started studying North Korea by their own means, many of whom are probably either attending this conference or watching it online, um, and have come to know certain aspects of the country almost obsessively. Uh, there's also simply more people working on North Korea than ever before because of North Korea's growing importance among mainstream global security issues. This broadens the pool of scholars and scholarships that help shape our understanding of the North Korean state. Um, but more importantly, there are more and more young people studying North Korea by choice. Um, so whereas a lot of the older generations of scholars, especially in the US, have stumbled into the North Korea policy world by the nature of their work, 
fact, that was their assignment and they learned what they needed to do um, by circumstance. Let's be real, few people in the US, for instance, studied North Korea at the university level in the past, um, in part because there were very few programs that even offered courses, much less concentrations on it. But the demand from young scholars for North Korea content is growing and universities are trying to respond. Um, and this will eventually facilitate generations of scholars who will study history, humanities, social and political development, not just North Korea's nuclear program. Um, so North Korea is also putting more information out in the public than it did either under Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il. During the Kim Jong-un era, we're now spoiled by more photos, more technical specs, more speeches, more pronouncements, more personal statements, and an ever-evolving public relations and communications approach to the world, um, giving the outside world more to work with than we've had before. And because of the age that we're in, networking and information among scholars, as we're seeing today, even by this conference, um, scholars, practitioners, and government is robust. We're not researching in isolation, uh, but have a good sense of others working on similar issues in the field and are constantly finding more and more people to bounce ideas off of, share information with, collaborate on research and more. Um, but it's not all fun and games, of course. Come to the bad. Um, one of the negative trends in studying North Korea is that North Korea's rise to mainstream level relevance was at the hands of numerous missile and nuclear tests. So each test being met then with punitive measures meant to cut off Pyongyang's access to the world, but in turn has also limited our access to North Korea as well. Um, so sanctions on republishing information, for instance, North Korean information and joint research has led to things like YouTube channels getting shut down, losing troves of North Korean news and documentary videos. Uh, sanctions have led to a near cutoff of people to people exchanges. And in the US, uh, even with track two organizers, we need OFAC licenses and government approvals to meet with North Korean counterparts. Um, and the travel ban on US citizens right now uh, to travel to North Korea has made it difficult for any kind of travel to the country outside limited humanitarian and media related visits. So at a time when ideally we'd want more access um, information and more opportunities to cultivate relationships on various levels of society. We have fewer and fewer as time goes on. The next issue I see may be somewhat controversial as I often hear criticism of researchers who work on North Korea who don't speak or read Korean. How could they ever know North Korea if they don't have these skills? And I can tell you, not everyone who can speak or read North Korean can really know North Korea either. Um, but the point is this, in a purely academic setting, yes, there is an expectation that someone specializing in Korea would gain the language, the cultural knowledge to understand these nuances. Um, but in the policy community and especially inside governments, for instance, there are a few positions that require deep language, knowledge, expertise. Moreover, the way assignments cycle, even people with Korean language knowledge are not necessarily working on Korea. And the people working on Korea do not necessarily have a Korea background. So the people closest to the decision-making and policy implementation often have the least background on the subject. Reporters too, for that matter. And I say this to suggest that there's a real need for more North Korean primary materials translated into English as well as studies and reports coming out of South Korea about the North for the benefit of the field. And yes, by all means, those working on North Korea or, or either Korea for that matter should be encouraged to learn and read Korean more. Um, but even then, unless they have instructors versed in North Korean vocabulary and vernacular, it won't always help them. Um, and it's a real disservice to the field in scholarship to assume that only Korean speakers or Korean readers should research or gain some level of expertise on the subject. As such, greater access is needed to North Korean dictionaries and lexicons to help improve understanding for, for even those who do speak and read some Korean, um, but maybe not North Korean specific vocabulary. 
Um, there's also an incredible need to train translators in both functional areas of expertise, as well as North Korean vocabulary and vernacular, to ensure that what is translated is accurate in meaning and not just a literal word for word translation. There's a big difference, for instance, between translating documents on cyber issues or special economic zone management um, versus the finer points of uranium enrichment or nuclear strategy or posture. So poor translations add little value to the field, but what an incredible service it would be um, it, to get a wealth of Korean language documents, reports, analyses from both North and South Korea translated in English by subject matter experts with specific North Korean language training to broaden the accessibility of information. It's a big ask, of course, um, but if there's one way to improve broader understanding, um, this is a necessity. Uh, a couple more negative trends that I see. Um, while there's a lot more people working on North Korea now, many are opportunistic researchers. That is, they adapt research to where the funding is. And so for right now, you have a predominant push for studies on North Korea's WMD programs, sanctions evaluations, and diplomatic research, such as peace treaties, negotiation strategies, and roadmaps. Uh, but what there is a shortage of is funding for other aspects of understanding North Korea, um, such as economic planning, not just sanctions tracking, social and political development, the evolution of the social contract, and so forth. Without more sources of funding for aspects of North Korea that would enhance our overall understanding of the country, of how the country is evolving, Recommendations and strategies on the WMD front will tend to be repetitive and limited in scope as they fixate primarily on the technology side of the equation and lack that, that understanding of the North Korean perspectives. And of course, there's the media. Um, yes, there are good reporters out there who do their due diligence on a normal basis, but the 24 hour news cycle means stories are written quickly, often with little context. And once it's out, everyone else must report on it too. In the North Korea field, we used to have to convince media, mainstream media especially, that something on North Korea was worth covering. Now, stories about North Korea proliferate instantaneously, seeing comments on developing stories and wanting quick and definitive takes, when often little is clear. This brings me to the ugly. Um, and now granted, ugly is probably too dramatic of heading for this section, but we're working on a theme here. So roll with me on this one. Um, one of the major problems we're seeing in analysis uh, where media is so ravenous um, for these issues is that there's often an eagerness to interpret day-to-day -day happenings with little consideration of context. For example, studies about the status of the North Korean economy often try to measure the impact of sanctions based on mere statistics and end up with assessments of the economy that give us a sense of how sanctions may be fulfilling our goals rather than how it may fare against, for instance, North Korea's budget projections at the beginning of the year. What does the domestic dialogue on economic thinking and planning tell us about how much they anticipated hard times and what they think is the best way forward. Um, and where are there other areas of debate? Um, even on the flooding issue, for instance, floods happen every year, can be anticipated, and measures are taken every year. Um, but what do flood prevention measures tell us about priority areas? And how does this year's floods actually compare to previous years? The same happens with satellite imagery. Um, the competition to be the first to report on any single image drives in, often drives incomplete or overconfident analysis. For instance, do trucks at a missile manufacturing facility on a specific date indicate suspicious activity? Well, perhaps not if there is a consistent number of trucks seen around that facility over a longer period of time. But you have to have a wealth of imagery to be able to make that assessment. For instance, are boats at a secure boat basin suggestive of a submarine launch ballistic missile test preparation? Well, perhaps under normal circumstances, but amid back-to-back -back typhoons, it may also just be a way to keep boats and ships in calmer waters until the storms pass. 
Another tendency in the ugly column is a reluctance to recognize North Korea's ability to adapt and evolve both as a society and in its strategic thinking. A simple example would be a change in missile and nuclear testing from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-il did very few tests and had an overtly political agenda when he did. Kim Jong-un's approach, however, seems to be more driven by technological advancement, um, accepting that political consequences to that decision are inevitable. Um, they test now until they're happy with the results and then they call for the production of those systems. This makes it harder, frankly, to anticipate when testing will happen as it's less tied to specific political dates or events. We've seen evolutions in the economy as well, especially on, say, for instance, state-owned enterprise management, um, giving more autonomy to the managers um, as long as profits are made. Uh, we've seen this in satellite imagery as well, where North Korea has improved their concealment and deception measures over time, making it harder to detect signs of activities like rocket engine tests um, or other kinds of test preparations to the point that when we do see signs that look definitively like test preparations, we have to ask ourselves, why are they showing us this as they know how to avoid the cameras? So these are all important considerations that sometimes get overlooked in a more competitive analytical space. Uh, but the moral of the story is, uh, it's a great time to be working on North Korea. Um, for once, there's broad interest and new blood in this field. And I think some of the stigma about increasing the understanding of how North Korea sees itself. Numerous challenges, of course, to increasing the breadth, depth, and quality of scholarship and analysis on North Korea. Um, but like the movie, ugly doesn't always mean bad, doesn't mean only bad, um, but the sum of all these parts are what we have that the sum of all these parts are that we now have new opportunities to work together in forums and consortiums like this to build a serious and active community of knowledge to enhance public understanding about North Korea and hopefully lead to better and more effective policies in the future. Thank you. The other talk. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping the time limit. And also, uh, thank you very much for joining us despite the 3 a.m. Uh, time zone uh, in your area. And I believe other speakers as well are in the morning time and others uh, in the Asian time zone. So thank you all very much for joining us despite the time differences. Next, uh, Professor John Nielsen White is going to uh, deliver his talk. Professor Nielsen White. Professor Nielsen White, we cannot hear your voice. Uh, it seems that we have a connection difficulty with Professor Nielsen White. So while he's uh, working on it, uh, why don't I invite Professor Shunji first? Yes, uh, if you can go ahead. Um, okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Then how can I share my slides? Uh, can someone help Professor uh, Hiraiwa to share his slides? Or, or do we have a connection with Professor Nielsen White? Professor Nielsen White, can you can you hear me? Professor Nielsen White, can you hear me? But can can you say something because we want to check if we can hear you. We cannot hear you, Professor Nielsen White. Ne on. Oh, 
So what uh, what should we? So can I go first? Uh, yes, Professor uh, Hirayama. Yes. So he, Professor Hiroi Washunji is going to speak first. He's going to speak uh, Japanese, and Japanese is going to be translated into Korean consecutively. And I'm going to be presenting in Japanese. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, North Korean policy in Japan. And I want to f briefly talk about the characteristics of North Korean research in Japan. After the World War II, uh, there are largely uh, four generations of North Korean research in Japan. The first generation is right after the war, and uh, the research started from researching on communist uh, party and communist uh, government, and they had a generation of very different, uh, very strong color and ideology, and there was a question on which uh, government had the legitimacy. The second generation of researchers were researchers after the normalization of diplomatic relations between Korea and Japan. They had some freedom, or they wanted to be free from ideology conflict, but still it had some political agenda. And they learned from the US researchers, or Korean US American researchers in the US. And the third generation, and I am part of this third generation of scholars, and after the 1987 democratization um, protests in Korea, uh, there was a lot to learn from Korea's researchers, and we were able to do uh, North Korea research freely, and we were able to learn a great deal from Chinese researchers as well. The fourth generations are the young researchers of today. Compared to the past, there are more information coming directly from North Korea, and the research has been broken down into a more granular details. But one thing I regret to see is that uh, there are many scholars that completely separate North Korea from South Korea, and that's something that we need to uh, fix. In terms of research methodology, uh, the key methodology is analysis based on official documents. And recently, uh, they use information from China and in, from ROK. And they also have access to uh, North Korea. And they go try to go beyond literature interpretation. In the past, uh, there there was an important usage important usage of the information coming from the North Korean Communist Party in Japan. But due to UN sanction, there's limited exchange between the North Korean Communist Party in Japan uh, with Japanese scholars. However, uh, the North Korean newspaper is useful in understanding the perspective and thinking of North Korea.
Recently, uh, North Korean studies as policy studies interests have heightened. And sin since the test of Tepodong number one missile, there has been heightened interest in missile studies. And there is also a perspective on studying abduction issue. And that's why today I would like to talk about Japan's uh, North Korean policy. When you look at the website of the Ministry of um, Diplomacy of Japan, uh, it says that they seek to solve the issues of abduction, nuclear and missile issues, and they want to normalize a uh, diplomatic relationship. And there are four motivations behind this. First motivation is to get rid of the remainings of the post-war process. Japan normalized diplomatic relationship with South Korea in '65, and Prime Minister Sato said the relationship with North Korea is in blank state, leaving possibility of normalizing relations with the North Korea. Many politicians show regret on intrusion uh, and uh, colonization of Korea, but the former Prime Minister Nakasone Hasehiro mentioned that we need to settle the post-war politics, and they had strong motivation to become a country that can provide a proactive role in the international society. The second motivation is security. Uh, put aside the current situation, uh, North Korea is asserting that they have successfully completed ICBM testing that puts the entire United States in the range. But this is not only a threat to the US, but uh, a bigger threat to Japan. And Japan also need to get rid of uh, the threat posed by the North Korea's short and medium range ballistic missiles. The third motivation is safety of Japanese people, especially the abduction or kidnapping issue of Japanese has become a top priority issue for, uh, for Japan since the uh, Prime Minister Goizumi's visit in 2002. Uh, Japan is uh, collaborating with Korea, the US, and China, but ultimately Japan needs to work with the North Korea to solve this issue. The fourth motivation is economic opportunity. If North Korea gives up on its nuclear uh, nuclear missile testing and carries out economic reform, it would be a great opportunity for Japanese companies. And rare earth element is a natural resource that many uh, countries are interested in. If Japan can participate in the development of this material, uh, it, it will have a good, great meaning for Japanese economy.
So due to these four factors, uh, Japan has been seeking a relationship with North Korea. But depending on which one is going to be more emphasized, each Japanese administration's policy towards North Korea is going to differ. But these four main factors are not going to change. But of course, it doesn't mean that Japan can unconditionally build relations with uh, DPRK. Uh, rather, it's going to be subject to the following three factors. The first factor is the international landscape. For example, during the Cold War, uh, Japan tried to uh, tra could couldn't transcend the east and west border, and it couldn't normalize its relations with North Korea. Uh, it was the same with its relations with China. But when there was a uh, detente between the U.S. and China starting 1972, it normalized its relations with China. Regarding the DPRK, again, the U.S. policy towards North Korea is going to be more important for Japan. Second factor is actually South Korea. For Japan, South Korea is an important ally. So Japan's policy towards North Korea cannot be pursued at the expense of the South Korean and Japanese relations. In 1988, President Roh Tae-woo made a July 7 announcement, and he agreed on improving relationship uh, with Japan and the U.S. and North Korea as well. But it doesn't mean that he's OK with uh, Japan. Uh, but it does mean that Japan is OK improving relations with North Korea at the expense of Korea, uh, South Korea. And the third factor is the domestic situation in Japan. And actually, Japan began uh, trying to normalize the relationship with the DPRK. Uh, towards the end of the Cold War at that time, the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan uh, needed uh, cooperation from Japan's Socialist Party. And Japan's Socialist Party wanted uh, to normalize the relationship with the DPRK. So because of the uh, situation within Japan, uh, the then vice uh, president of the LDP uh, Kanemaru visited DPRK and the negotiation to normalize the relationship between the DPRK and Japan began. The negotiation stopped in November 1992, but after that, the JSP and the LDP uh, formed a coalition government, namely the Murayama administration. And the negotiation resumed again in 2000. So uh, the LDPs, uh, when they needed the cooperation between the JSP, then they were more active in seeking a normal relationship with the DPRK. But uh, once the coalition government ended, uh, the Socialist Party has much less influence. But again, after uh, Prime Minister Goizumi's visit to the DPRK, Japanese people are now interested in the abduction issue. So that began to have an influence on Japan's policy towards uh, DPRK.
So because of this, uh, Japan's policy towards the DPRK is dependent on these three factors. So if Japan wants to pursue relationship with the DPRK, it should not just appeal to North Korea. It also needs assistance from uh, the international landscape and also a better relationship with South Korea also needs to persuade its own people. So for Japan to autonomously pursue relationship with the DPRK, uh, it needs to check not only its own policy, but also these above three factors. Roughly speaking, uh, after the 1990s, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, to do the time limit, I cannot talk about this slide in details, but uh, in year 2017, all factors were negative, but I turned uh, positive uh, in 2018, and Prime Minister Abe mentioned dialogue without condition, but the DPRK has not responded to this so far. And uh, in Japan, Prime Minister Abe uh, said that he's going to step down. But basically, Japan's position on abduction, nuclear issue, a missile issue is not going to change. And uh, that will still be the broad framework for Japan's policy towards the DPRK. And the next prime minister in Japan, I'm not sure if he's going to uh, say he's willing to have dialogue without condition with the DPRK, but still, Japan is not going to sacrifice South Korea in pursuing relationship with uh, the DPRK. And also, the abductees' family members are now quite old, so it's going to be a more urgent issue for the new prime minister as well. What is kind of uh, fluid right now is the U.S. presidential election. So depending on who's going to win, I believe the international landscape may change significantly. And also uh, the next government in Japan, uh, what kind of attitude it will have towards the U.S. going forward is going to matter. So, so far, I've been talking uh, about uh, North Korean studies uh, from the Japanese perspective. But what matters most is actually the attitude from the DPRK. And I'm sure for that, uh, their own domestic situation is going to be important as well. So I believe the next uh, administration in Japan is going to consider all these factors uh, when they decide on their policy towards the DPRK. Thank you very much for your presentations. So, so far, we listened to two presenters. First, Dr. Town talked about uh, North Korean studies in the U.S. And she talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the second presenter, Professor Shinoya Shinji, talked about the different generations of North Korean studies and also talked about four motivation and four factors determining North Korean policy in Japan. Next, we would like to invite Professor Nielsen Wright. Professor Wright, are you connected? We can hear you. Thank you. Yes, I do. For the, um, the problem with the. I'm going to turn off the translation because I'm unfortunately hearing the feedback from the translator. Can you still hear me? Hello? Yes, uh, 
Yes, we can hear you well. Yes, I'll deliver. Okay. Um, I'm only hearing you in fragments, so my apologies. I will go ahead with my presentation. Let me um, make sure that I can share the screen with you. Let me begin, if I may, by um, echoing the points that Jenny Tan so eloquently uh, presented in her uh, overview and say, perhaps at the beginning, a few words about the perspective of North Korean studies in the United Kingdom before moving on to talk a little bit more um, generally about the role that European countries might play in terms of addressing the challenge of the DPRK. Um, Korean studies in the United Kingdom very much comes out of a tradition of area studies, which has been well established going back now to um, the early post-war period. Um, it has been, well, let me just move to whole screen mode. I just see I've had a message from uh, administrators. The, the tradition of area studies in the United Kingdom reflected in particularly the focus on China and Japan um, has expanded to incorporate um, a detailed focus on Korean studies in general, not just the DPRK, with centers in Cambridge and Sheffield, School of Oriental and African Studies in London, um, and of course, Oxford University. Um, but increasingly, again, to echo what Jenny was saying, as North Korea has become an issue that is of relevance to international relations specialists, and political scientists, it has become a much more central part of disciplinary work on North Korea. Um, this has been helped also by the commitment of the Korean government to support research into Korea at uh, think tanks. My own think tank, Chatham House, um, has benefited from considerable support from the Korea Foundation and with the establishment of a new uh, career fellowship position, which I occupy as the inaugural post holder. Um, we have been the beneficiary of support and are able, therefore, to give more attention to the DPRK. Um, uh, my colleague Ramon Pacheco at King's College London has also, um, through the support of the Korea Foundation, been able to Korean studies more broadly, not just in the United Kingdom, but also in Europe. Um, some of this has been undercut, of course, by the, the tendency to somewhat superficial coverage uh, in the mass media, particularly amongst the UK tabloid press, uh, which has routinely um, embraced a somewhat sensationalist approach for talking about North Korean issues. But I think even allowing for that problem, it's worth highlighting the extent to which, particularly amongst young journalists, uh, many of whom have increasingly had um, training in Korean studies, uh, one of my former students, James Pearson, went on to be the Reuters correspondent in South Korea, and uh, he and his colleagues have done an immense amount of work in providing much more balanced coverage about the DPRK. And I think that underlines the importance of sustained support for educational initiatives in training the next generation of career specialists. And here again, it's worth highlighting the work of the Korea Foundation through its own next generation program, which I think has been immensely helpful uh, to, for expanding our knowledge on North Korea. Um, one thing that's, of course, worth citing in the context of the United Kingdom is the importance of diplomatic relations and the establishment of a British embassy back in 2000 um, has had a huge sustained but incremental impact in enhancing our understanding of the DPRK. We now have a small but very influential, what I might describe as epistemic, community of former ambassadors, British ambassadors, who have had considerable experience living and working in the DPRK, and that has helped us expand our knowledge. The British government, of course, through its sustained contact with the DPRK, has been um, quietly but instrumentally very important in providing more opportunities for engagement, uh, particularly through the British Council, which has been extremely important in training um, English language experts and specialists in the DPRK and providing a sustainable foundation for long-term contact between the United Kingdom and the DPRK. Uh, and it's 
often I think at an individual level, just as I cited the case of individual journalists, I think it's worth highlighting the important personal ties that are often a basis for expanding research into the DPRK. Um, it was some years ago, back in 2002, that the then South Korean ambassador to the United Kingdom, Ra Jong Il, who himself is a graduate of Cambridge University, sought to establish a lecture series. And that lecture series has been um, at Cambridge an opportunity for us to highlight new research into DPRK as well as broader Korean issues. I should also mention the importance of the Yun Po Sun Foundation, named after the former president of South Korea. Uh, Yun Sang Koo, the son of Yun Po Sun, um, has been instrumental in strengthening ties between the United Kingdom and Korea in general. And of course, Yun Po Sun was the first British, first Korean student to graduate from a British university, from the University of Edinburgh, which has also uh, been very influential in trying to develop our awareness of Korean issues. Uh, in all of this, it's also important, I think, to stress when we think about the policy dimensions and better understanding the DPRK, how important it is to integrate historical research into our understanding of the DPRK. Uh, and some of that, I think, is a function of the work, again, of individual historians and area specialists. I think of my Cambridge colleague, Honik Kwon, um, who has been very active in broadening our understanding of the DPRK and helping to inspire and train a new generation of uh, European Koreanists. Um, but in all of this, of course, in, in conducting historical or sociological or anthropological research, we need access to documentation. And of course, it's in countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, which has a well-established tradition of declassifying historical information and documents, that we have a very useful resource, a useful set of primary resources. In Asia, of course, that willingness to declassify sensitive documentary evidence um, is arguably much less developed. Uh, governments need to be more transparent. They need to be, be more willing to provide access to historical data that can sometimes be, um, be controversial, uh, can conflict with contemporary policy priorities. Uh, and we need bold leaders who are willing, I think, to make some of those changes. Um, let me, in the very brief time that I have remaining, say a few words about the European contribution um, that might be made in terms of thinking about the immediate security crisis. We know, of course, that denuclearization is currently at an impasse. Uh, for well-rehearsed reasons, the unwillingness of the Trump administration to engage post Hanoi, the willingness of Kim Jong-un to focus both on strategic readiness and economic reform, and we've seen that in personnel appointments within the current administration that suggests that uh, a more focused approach on building up the North's uh, strategic capabilities will continue. Um, and of course, a very ambivalent relationship with South Korea reflected in different language, both from Kim Jong-un and the more provocative approach of his sister. Progress, of course, in reaching out to the North has been helped by the catalyzing role of President Moon. Um, and again, personnel appointments have been extremely important as part of that process of revitalizing, if you like, the spirit of the North-South Summit of 2000. Uh, and we see with the new unification minister, an effort to build pragmatic links with the North, despite the standoff between the United States and uh, the DPRK. Um, in all of this, I would stress how important the current COVID-19 crisis is, both in terms of underlying the limitations of the DPRK, um, but also the opportunities that they present for other countries to engage um, in more humanitarian-based forms of assistance. And I include in that the importance of training and education. Um, the impact of closing the border with China by the North Korean authorities back in January have been real in terms of uh, foreign currency shortage, the impact of inflation, panic buying, um, and sanctions, of course, are having a very real impact, particularly on the ability of North Korean workers overseas to repatriate critical resources. But it's the health and food crisis that provides the principal opportunity for uh, increased engagement, particularly in the health area. And we know from a study released by Johns Hopkins University um, that North Korea languishes at uh, the level of 193rd out of 195 countries in terms of its health security. 15.3 million Koreans are also food insecure, which helps to explain why the current set of floods is imposing real pressure on the administration and while its official policy remains one of self-reliance, 
we've seen behind the scenes efforts by the North to reach out to foreign countries, which then raises, of course, the question of what could Europeans do? In this, I think there needs to be a nuanced approach which combines both the importance of sanctions and preventative measures to limit the risk of provocation from the North. And I've listed some of these on, on the slide here, but also a willingness to recognize how fragile alliance relations are between the United States and South Korea, despite the long-term historical structural connections between these two countries. And much of that, of course, is attributable to the more transactional approach of Donald Trump and the continuing deadlock over host nation support. Why is that worrying? Again, to, to go back to my earlier point about historical referencing, uh, understanding the danger of um, mixed signals and miscalculation. The scholars of the Korean War will remember all too well, of course, the danger of those mixed signals back in 1950. Um, and of course, all of this is happening at a time of political change and transition in countries within the region. We've seen within Japan, as we heard from the previous speaker, um, a preoccupation with the issue of regional security, a willingness on the part of some in Japan to embrace um, forms of, of hedging against the North Korean threat that may involve the risk of uh, preemptive measures. All of this, I think, demonstrates how Europeans can be part of that process uh, by providing reassurance the deployment of UK maritime assets to the region is seen by some as a sign of reassurance. Um, and as North Korea faces increased currency shortages and may be inclined to turn to some of its more covert measures of uh, providing disruption through cyber attacks, there are opportunities for Europeans and Asian countries to work more closely together. But to come back to the issue of engagement, its efforts to provide ameliorative measures to incentivize the North, Korea, North Korean regime to cooperate, where I think Europeans can offer something real and substantive. We've already seen through statements from the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights a willingness to, to embrace some of these reforms. One area where I think there is perhaps room for close cooperation is in sustainable development. And nominally at least, North Korea through some of its public statements going back to 2017 has been quite vocal in supporting sustainable development. It is an open issue to what extent the regime is genuinely serious um, but it provides at least a roadmap for areas where Europeans can cooperate with the North. Um, in this context, I'd like to stress again the importance of education. Um, in the United Kingdom here in Cambridge, we have had a number of visits by North Korean scholars, um, and the importance of this should not be underestimated in terms of building trust and cooperation. Uh, my colleague at Sussex University, Kevin Gray, who uh, is very active in the field of North Korean studies, is similarly trying to develop some of these sorts of partnerships and I would argue we need more of this effort, but we also need to do it in a way where we coordinate with other actors in Europe and elsewhere to share experience, um, to provide, if you like, an informal network whereby we can audit the effects, the successes and the um, disappointments associated with these sorts of initiatives so we can learn from one another's experience. And I think, again, to echo, echo what Jenny was saying earlier, um, there has been a great deal of progress in this area. Um, some areas where, of course, we have seen limitations has been, of course, in the question of human rights. And even though Donald Trump, very opportunistically, back in 2018 in his State of the Union address, highlighted the issue of human rights, we have seen the human rights agenda, to some extent, be compromised by the more obvious and immediate concerns of security. I would stress again here the role of um, informal contacts, particularly through parliamentarians, um, as a means of not shying away from the human rights issues, uh, but trying to find opportunities to build trust and dialogue with North Korean counterparts. The work, for example, of Sir David Orton, a member of the House of Lords, has been particularly relevant, I think, in allowing the human rights agenda to remain part of the bilateral discourse between the United Kingdom and the DPI. Okay. In all of this, however, leaders consistently need to be aware of the limitations of public engagement. And as we find um, global politics now transformed by the threat of populist and nationalist driven agendas, it is important to emphasize how both academics and think tanks need to keep the North Korean issue at the forefront of the agenda for a sustained, to go back to my earlier reference to sustainable development, a sustained political engagement with these issues. Uh, and in all of this, I think we need to recognize the importance of both financial support, support from funding bodies in Korea and elsewhere to demonstrate to ordinary individuals that this is a critical issue 
and to move away from the focus on some of the more alarmist, somewhat cartoon-like images of the North Korean regime that have been so much a part of our media discourse. But um, with that, and allowing for some of the technical issues, um, I'll stop here and welcome your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Nielsen White talked about the UK's understanding and how it has evolved over time in understanding the North Korea. And also he discussed about uh, the policies in the EU. And we were able to hear the policy stance of the EU and it's pursuing security and human rights as well as uh, exchanges with the North Korea. It's not going to be easy to follow all of that. Uh, and having said that, now I have Professor Jiong Jong as the next discussant. Have we lost him? Then while we try to reconnect with Professor Zhang, why don't we invite uh, Professor Rukin? Professor Archam Rukin, can you go first? Is that OK? Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chan. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me, for having me on this very interesting panel. And of course, I'm very happy to, to see my um, old friends, Jenny, <laughs> down in particular. So uh, uh, I was, uh, like everyone else, I was asked to speak about uh, the state of North Korean countries uh, in my own country, Russia. Uh, but maybe uh, I'm going to disappoint you because uh, uh, in Russia there is no such thing as North Korean status. <laughs> uh, we have just uh, Korean status and uh, I think that's quite understandable. Uh, that's because uh, Russia, uh, frankly, uh, is not very much interested in uh, North Korea for, uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, we just uh, don't see North Korea as a, as a threat. <laughs> You know, so in the U.S., in Japan, uh, North Korean studies uh, are a big thing because uh, you guys see North Korea as a threat, as a challenge, right? In South Korea, uh, North Korean studies, you know, it's obvious, is a big thing because because of your unification uh, agenda. Uh, but you know, uh, in Russia, uh, we just have Korean studies, which are mostly focused on the ROK. Uh, on South Korea, which is much more interesting to Russia in terms of, you know, <laughs> economic benefits and humanitarian and cultural exchanges. Uh, so, oh, yes, uh, North Korean studies are just, you know, a subfield in general Korean studies in Russia, which are mostly focused on, on South Korea. So that's our kind of academic reality. But of course, of course, uh, Russia does have uh, does have uh, a lot of expertise uh, on North Korea uh, due to two reasons. Uh, one uh, reason uh, is, of course, the special relationship which exists uh, between Russia and North Korea. Uh, historically, and uh, you know, of course, that Russia is one of the very few countries which main maintain you know, regular contacts uh, with, with North Korea. We have a North Korean community inside Russia consisting of North Korean workers, diplomats, and students. So, of course, this community, this North Korean community has shrunk in recent years uh, because, of, uh, because of sanctions. But uh, some North Koreans are still there, and uh, I can give you just uh, my personal example. I have several North Korean kids uh, as my students who are uh, enrolled in our international relations program uh, here at my Forest and Federal uh, University. And I, uh, from time to time, I uh, communicate, I, you know, have, you know, dinners or lunches with uh, North Korean diplomats who are stationed here in Vladivostok. 
so uh, we do have some interaction uh, with uh, you know with real North Koreans uh, here in Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there is a Russian uh, community, Russian community inside North Korea, mostly diplomats, mostly Russian diplomats who are posted in Pyongyang. And of course, you know that the Russian embassy in Pyongyang is the biggest foreign mission uh, in North Korea, maybe along with China's embassy. Uh, and Russia also maintains uh, a consulate, general consulate in Chongjin. And uh, there is also uh, a small Russian community in Rajin, in the port of Rajin, where Russia uh, operates uh, Rason Contrans, a port and rail uh, joint venture. Well, actually, Russia uh, owns 70% of this venture, so actually Russia manages this venture. And there are a few dozen Russians who, who reside uh, in, in, uh, in Rajin. So it's also a very important window, a window into, into North Korea. But uh, the focus, uh, my main focus in my remarks today would be uh, on another advantage that we Russians have in understanding North Korea. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, this advantage uh, is about uh, the similarity uh, which exists between our two countries, you know, Russia and North Korea. Uh, so my argument is, uh, that as political entities, uh, Russia and North Korea uh, share many significant similarities. Therefore, if you know Russia, uh, you can better understand North Korea uh, and vice versa. So uh, let me elaborate uh, a little bit more on these similarities, which, as I think, uh, exist between Russia and the DPRK history. Uh, of course, DPRK was formed uh, thanks to the Soviet Union, and to a great extent, it was created after the image of Stalinist Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, Joseph Stalin handpicked Kemal Son to be the leader of the newly formed uh, DPRK. Of course, Stalin has uh, long since been dead, right? And the USSR is no more. But Stalin's legacy lives on in various manifestations, both in modern Russia and in the DPRK. And uh, uh, sadly, but I can tell you uh, that the spirit of Stalin and some of his practices it, are still very much alive among the Russians. And I'm, I'm afraid uh, uh, the spirit of Stalin is very much alive in the Kremlin too. <laughs> well, uh, or maybe it's a good thing. I, I just don't know. It's just the reality. Uh, in other words, uh, there is some shared political genesis uh, between the DPRK and the modern Russian Federation. So what about the character of political regimes? Or of course, DPRK's political system is built around the family of the kings and the personality cults. Uh, this is very much a personalist autocracy, uh, where the figure of the supreme leader is essential and crucial to the function of the system. In the same vein, uh, contemporary Russia is very much a personalist, quasi-monarchical autocracy with Vladimir Putin as the supreme leader, even though uh, Russia's political regime does not have the dynastic succession for now. Uh, remove the Kims and the DPRK's entire political system may collapse, as you know. Remove Putin and Russia may find itself on the verge of chaos. So we, the Russians, we understand it very well. So I think it gives us some affinity with the North Koreans. Uh, and also uh, Russia's and uh, North Korea's political systems are Byzantine in their nature. Uh, decision-making at the top levels is extremely opaque. Uh, and we have very little idea uh, about how decisions are made in the Kremlin, how they're made in Pyongyang, uh, almost the same level of, you know, <laughs> of uh, opaqueness. And uh, it's also interesting that personal lives of Kim and Putin are shrouded in secrecy. About Putin's family, we only know that he's officially divorced and uh, he has two daughters. That's it. That's it. Uh, it's just about as much as we know about Kim Jong-un's family. Well, maybe we know about Putin's uh, family just a little bit more, but not by much. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, another very important point is uh, the importance of sovereignty. Sovereignty for both Russia and North Korea state sovereignty in the sense of being a fully independent and self-sufficient political unit has the paramount importance. Paramount importance. Unlike most other countries that only have nominal or titular sovereignty, Russia and North Korea, uh, I would argue, possess full political independence and they are ready to defend it at any cost. Related to sovereignty are the matters of status, international status. Russia and North Korea are extremely sensitive with regard to their standing in the international system. Russia views itself as a great power, uh, and the great power status is an essential part of, of the Russian national identity. So it's part of myself, for example, it's part of other Russians, it's part of uh, Putin's personality. And the DPRK uh, does not officially identify itself as a great power. But uh, as some uh, observers uh, have argued, uh, despite its small size, uh, North Korea systematically behaves like a great power. And its actions uh, can be interpreted uh, from this angle. So uh, it can be identified as a small great power. And as far as I remember, North Korea does call itself a nuclear power of the East, uh, if I'm not wrong. So it's a real great power, albeit small one. Uh, and uh, of course, this makes another connection between uh, Russian identity and North Korean identity. Uh, and uh, another important point is that for both Russia and North Korea, this claim to the great power status is very much based on the military capabilities rather than soft power or economic accomplishments. Uh, in economic terms, Russia and North Korea are basically irrelevant uh, in the global system. Even Russia's huge hydrocarbon reserves are less and less important uh, today due to, due to the ongoing decarbonization trends and due to the rising competition from other energy suppliers. So military power is the single most important guarantee of both uh, sovereignty and international influence for, for, for Russia and North Korea. Uh, and our two countries, we share very high levels of militarization. Uh, for example, the defense industry forms the core of uh, economic systems, both in Russia and North Korea. And of course, it's nuclear weapons uh, that make Russia and North Korea formidable military powers in the first place. And I would argue that Russia and North Korea are the only uh, nations uh, in the world where nuclear weapons have become integral part of uh, national identities, of national psyche. Uh, one might even argue that uh, nuclear weapons have become sacred, both to Russia and North Korea. It's our holy grail, so to speak. And Russia is never going to abandon nukes, never. Uh, and so is North Korea. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, we, the Russians, are much better grasp uh, much better understand uh, the nature of emotional attachment that uh, the North Koreans feel to their nukes. We understand why the North Koreans will never let go of their nuclear weapons. Maybe for, for the Americans, uh, maybe for the British, it's uh, a little bit difficult to understand why, but we, we understand. Uh, international isolation. Uh, of course, uh, North Korea and Russia are countries that have been experiencing a considerable degree of international you know, um, isolation and sanctions and condemnation. Uh, unfortunately, it is now not uncommon to refer to Russia as a rogue state, just as North Korea has long been labeled a rogue state. And being placed in the same category of rogues, you know, makes for another affinity <laughs> between, uh, between our two countries. Uh, that's why we can understand uh, the North Koreans better uh, for this uh, reason. Uh, and a few words about similarities in uh, Russia and North Korea's strategic behavior. Uh, I think uh, both Moscow and Pyongyang and Pyongyang share uh, the willingness to go to the brink, uh, being the weaker party vis-a-vis -vis their main adversary, the United States, both North Korea and Russia compensate their relative weakness through more resolve and audacity. 
Uh, in other words, uh, Russia and North Korea are inclined to bring man to brinkmanship and escalation, often testing the red lines of their adversaries. And Russia and North Korea are very good at playing the game of chicken. Uh, so uh, Russia is uh, more risk acceptant than uh, most Western governments would be, and that's why in uh, face-offs Russia often wins, and uh, that's also true with regard to uh, to, to North Korea. Uh, and maybe the final, uh, uh, my, my time is running out, I think. So uh, I think uh, the final point uh, I would like to make uh, is uh, uh, our, you know, uh, attitude to, to, to China. Uh, both uh, North Korea and Russia are increasingly dependent on China. Of course, North Korea is still much more dependent on China than Russia is, but uh, Russia's dependence on China is also growing. Uh, uh, the North Koreans have long been, you know, uncomfortable, un uneasy about their dependence on China. So we, the Russians, we we are beginning to understand, you know, what it means too. So maybe uh, that's another uh, point of commonality between uh, between uh, Russia and North Korea. So uh, uh, I would like to just to conclude that, you know, uh, being being a Russian or being someone who uh, knows Russia very well uh, helps you to, you know, to make sense of North Korea. <laughs> so maybe uh, that's Russia's, you know, biggest contribution to, to the field of North Korean studies. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for Professor Lukin. And uh, you gave us a very detailed uh, viewpoint, Russian viewpoint, regarding North Korean studies. One, there's a new independent study called North Korean studies uh, in uh, Russia. And also, Russia shares a lot of similar experiences with the DPRK. So Russian people feel some sort of identification with the DPRK. And also, in terms of the relationship with China as well, uh, Russia Russia uh, feels uh, some sort of affinity uh, towards the DPRK. I think that uh, I know two uh, Russian. Uh, Russians who are great experts on DPRKs and who are working in Seoul. So uh, it was a great. Uh, so I, uh, it was great pleasure to listen to your view, Professor Chung. If you are connected, yes, can you go ahead? And uh, thank you for KGFP to uh, of having me here. Yeah. I'm very appreciated of three of these four present presenters. Very good presentations. And especially uh, Shin Shinji Hirewa reflect my height with Japan's view. And Nielsen give me a very, very clear and a big picture of a European view of researching North Korea now. And now I think I totally agree with Jenny that uh, her views really reflect the status in USA of studying North Korea in USA. And I think in addition to, to, to Jenny, I, I would like to discuss uh, several points. And one is that the, there is a shortage of the basic information and the basic intelligence for many universities and the think tanks in USA, especially in Washington, D.C. Uh, as I just came back from USA just two months ago, researching North Korea in USA, I, I'm sorry to say that uh, just like some kind of the, the business and the business of getting fame and money with shocking news and disinformation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry for saying that, that, uh, that uh, but uh, many researchers in USA that they even cannot find North Korea or Korean Peninsula in the map. 
But I think they are they they they, they are very frank and they dare to say uh, Kim Jong Un's I, I, everything, and they can even give the the White House a grand view of bombing Pyongyang or somewhere. But I'm very very shocked by 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 their views. Yeah. Yeah. And the two is that the USA, USA has a wishful thinking toward North Korea in, 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 uh, in, in other words, that the, the image in U the USA, the North Korea image in USA is not the, U the North Korea itself. It's just the image that the USA wants to believe in and wants to make Make some pic picture, make some pictures to to show them to us. And the three is that they researched the USA, and they have very few, or they have no patience of studying North North Korea. As we know, for USA. It had two very simple ways to solve the global affairs. One is that you must become my, my alliance. So I just control you. I need not to study you. So, but no necessary to research on the Korean Peninsula. And the two is that if you cannot become my friend, my, my, my alliance, that that will be very, very simpler. I will invade and, and attack you or, or bomb you, you are, because you are my enemy. And I have... And, and even the officials in the, in the State Department, such, such as Steve Began, they do not know the culture in the, in the Korean Peninsula. For 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 uh, for instance, I think one thing that the 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 self uh, the deputy secretary of the state department, uh, he wanted to DMZ and to uh, to urge the North North Korea's deputy uh, 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 foreign minister, the uh, Tsai he to come out and to re re respond to his appeals to talk. But I think one thing, but I think he, he, he really did not know one thing, that 8th July is the death day of Kim Il-sung. Because as we know, the Kim Il-sung is the founder of DPRK and the grandfather of Kim Jong-un. In, in, in Korea Peninsula, it's a very, very big taboo in China and the Korea Peninsula to, to, to talk about something with, with, with others. Yeah. And I, 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 I would like to talk about the North Korea study in China now. My view is that the China uh, of course, China has advantage of resisting North Korea because China and North Korea are neighbors. We share, we share, we share history, we share borders, and we share language and the sentiment and the culture and the politics as well. I think everyone here can understand this point very well, but. This kind of the researching advantage do not mean policy advantage. China has the China has more policy shortage than USA and South Korea. And I think USA and North Korea, South, South, South Korea can make a very, very simple policy toward Pyongyang due to the information.
But China cannot make a very, very simple policy t toward no North Korea because we have, we have many information advantages and the very, very complicated relations among USA and the South, and the South Korea and the Japan. Even, even China's domestic affairs can affect the policy toward North Korea. A simple case that is that China gave a huge support of food aid to North Korea in the, this March. But China does not want to let others know that I think China think, thinks that if if they aid, if they aid, let someone know that they it can make the international relations between China and South Korea, China and the US more complicated. So the consequence is that China's policy toward North Korea has so much obstacles. But just because of the information advantage. It, it only can stand on two, two, two poles. Do, I, do everything or do not, nothing. Or to embrace no, North Korea in arms or slow down. I think that do everything or do nothing. There is a I think uh, uh, we know one uh, Chinese, uh, the famous Chinese saying is that if we let it be, there will be a mess. And if we handle it, the death will come right after. So far, this dilemma makes China very confused for many years. China, China tried to break away from the doomed cycle to change and manage North Korea from now with more hand hands. And I think China will use its uh, uh, information about the, the economical information or the cultural or the political this this these methods and ways to handle North Korea more carefully. And to make a more more careful and more uh, 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 how to say that uh, more more good policy towards North Korea. So as to avoid the, the old problem of management being overly lax one moment and overly tight the next. And pave a new path of the joint management and the benign interactions. And one thing I want, I want to point out is that for China, the biggest concern and the biggest problem is North Korea's nuclear. Frankly to say, we don't know North Korea's new nuclear.
because uh, as we know, even we know North Korea very, very well uh, in, the, in the culture and the politics, uh, even the eco economy. And we can, we can control North Korea's economy and the culture very well, but we, we don't know the new nuclear bombs. So from this aspect, we can know the the future of China's North Korea policy will will tend to will tend to a direction of carefully to control North North Korea, and um, and uh, and make the ba the balance of the policy be between China and uh, South Korea and uh, no. North Korea. And we don't, and we don't know because uh, Pre President Xi will visit Seoul in, in the next October. You know, you know, China is now having a very pro South Korea policy instead of the, instead of a pro North Korea policy. It, uh, and as I think China will make South Korea more happy, uh, make South Korea ha ha happier of, of, con of controlling North Korea well. And I will stop here. Thank you all. And uh, comes up with that. more. Thank you. I think uh, two points were made. First, Professor Zhang mentioned that the U.S. In your view, uh, uh, the U.S. has misinformation about North Korea. I guess, Dr. Tao, you can respond to this. I'm sure you have a lot to say to respond to that. And also you talked about North Korean policy by China. So China understands North Korea extensively, and there are many information that China has on North Korea. And because you have so much information, it's very difficult for you to act or respond. So it's going to be a very careful policy when it comes to your North Korean policy. And in your closing, you also said that uh, President Xi uh, will be visiting Korea uh, in November, October. I think I, I'm hearing that from you for the first time. And then uh, next uh, presenter would be uh, Dr. Hong. I would like to thank our organizer for making this forum possible. And I'm also happy that we can have this forum in multiple locations. I'm happy and sad that we're meeting um, from various locations. And I was listening to all our speakers and all our discussant. We do have a plastic wall. I don't know whether you can see it, but we have a plastic wall between my moderator and myself. And likewise, I believe that North Korea and Korea and other countries also have this kind of um, transparent wall. So we have this type of plastic wall in between us, and we hope to remove this wall going forward. As a discussant, I want to mention two things. First, what's the progress to date? in Korea about North Korean study. And in my second part of the talk, I would like to uh, also ask some question to our speakers. So that's how I'm going to construct my talk. In Korea, when we say North Korean studies, we look at the political, economic, and social aspects of North Korea in uh, the North Korean studies. And here it includes reunification policy and unification research as well. And recently, we are seeing peace study too. So we are 
carrying out peace study to build peace system on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that peace study, I think, has a great role and many areas to apply. And many also mentioned this, and Professor Sunji also mentioned this, but during the Cold War, uh, we didn't have uh, North Korea study per se, but we talked about peace paradigm or security paradigm. And North Korea was discussed as a, uh, as a conflict actor. So we focus more on security or issues of security uh, during the Cold War. But after the Cold War, what became a important issue in 1980s and 1980s and 70s is that we wanted to see North Korea uh, as it is. And we call this internalized uh, approach or inherent approach. So we took an inherent approach to North Korea to see North Korea as they are. And I think that opened door to a new level of research on North Korea studies. And during the uh, and post Cold War, we were able to do a great uh, empirical studies. And we've seen a lot of defectors after that. And we were able to understand North Korea um, more and understand the daily lives of North Korean people. And we had opportunity to understand uh, their livelihood. And in the past, because of the security paradigm, we were not able to see the official document like the No Dong Shin Mun. But now we have access to it, and now we can read through it. So we were able to expand the scope of North Korean study. So we were able to combine macro and micro level of studies after 2000. And after 2000, we were able to see the day-to-day -day lives of uh, North Korean people, and we were able to carry out micro-level studies to understand the lifestyle and livelihood of the ordinary North Korean people. And we started thinking about uh, the aim of the North Korean study, and that led to peace paradigm or discourse on uh, peace paradigm. And accordingly, we were able to expand uh, the scope of North Korean study even further. And the key benefit or the key aspects of North Korea study is that it has various perspectives that you can apply. And it's very difficult to apply a certain theory on the North Korean studies. What's the limitation there? As you know, the limitation comes from North Korea's closeness. They're isolated country. That's why there's limitation in terms of information accessibility. And also, uh, interviewing and uh, understanding North Korean's defector alone is not enough. Uh, although, uh, and Dr. Town mentioned this, but we need to also secure objectivity of uh, this kind of um, interviews. So we did have some uh, reflection that uh, there's certain limitation in studying just North Korean defectors. So in the new era, how are we going to make North Korean study a more fact-based study? That's why we pursue index-based study. So many institutions come up with um, forecasting model to come up with North Korea outlook. And they try to come up with um, quantitative measures to make it fact-based. But then there's an issue of N, N meaning uh, how credible is the number. So North Korean study is evolving, but there's always a dilemma and there's always a limitation. In the past, it focused on security and it also focused on North Korean system and its institution. And because we focused on that aspect, we always had this uh, question on how we're going to link that back to North Korean study. Uh, in my personal view, we have to dis discover scientific approach to North Korean study. And we also need to build theory behind North Korean study to further broaden the 
scope of North Korean study and link that to other multiple discipline. And we have to break uh, this visible war, wall or plastic wall. And I want to end my talk with uh, the North Korean study trend. I studied North Korean study in the U.S. and the view of the U.S. North Korean scholars and a South Korean scholar is different. And even within Korea, there are diverse perspective or viewpoint uh, in Korea. So uh, there's a dichotomy across different scholars on how they view North Korea. So it's difficult to do open discussion. As I mentioned earlier, that's why it's very important to break down this wall in our studies. And also, in my institution, KINU, the Korean Institute of National Unification, uh, deals with North Korean studies extensively. And as Professor Nielsen White uh, mentioned, it's very important to have uh, Korean government support. And also, public diplomacy uh, from the private sector is very important in increasing North Korean study. So Korea need to take lead to further develop this study. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I have some questions that I want to pose before I stop. And uh, we heard that Russia does not have uh, North Korea studies, but they're still looking into uh, North Korea. So my question is, uh, what are some of the area that you're looking into in North Korea studies? And what's the recent trend in looking into North Korea? And has there been any evolution of methodology or approach in studying North Korea? Since we have everyone from different countries, we want to understand uh, how each country is thinking about this question. Thank you very much. So we've listened to all six panelists. So once again, in South Korea, there's a lot of research and studies uh, regarding the DPRK. So uh, Dr. Hong briefly mentioned that. And we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, I was hoping to have about 50 minutes for our free discussion, but we have only 20 minutes left. So uh, first of all, I think I need to give our panelists to, to respond to each other. But, uh, but I would like to ask a question to five of you. Uh, and. And please do not feel obliged to answer my question exclusively. Uh, my, uh, you can use my question as an inspiration to share your thought. So uh, regarding Professor Chung's remark, I believe uh, Dr. Town must have some feedback to share. And also uh, in Washington, D.C., based on my experiences, for uh, CIA analysts uh, do a lot of analysis on DPRK, and security is very much focused. So CIA uh, analysts are driving uh, mostly uh, the research into DPRK with particular emphasis on security. Do you think it has any impact or implications on the overall uh, North Korean studies in the US? So that's my question to you. And next, Professor uh, Hirayua. So you mentioned that in Japan, there's a, like a separate two tracks, one track for South Korean study, another stack for North Korean studies. What about some cohesive study? Do you think, can you envision more cohesive cohesive study encompassing both Koreas. And another question is that you mentioned that South Korea is an important factor for Japan's policy towards the DPRK. Do you think that uh, what is your future outlook for the South Korean and Japanese relations? And uh, Professor Nielsen White, I think you touched upon policy aspect a lot, but I found one paradox. So you emphasized both humanitarian aspect and security aspect as well, but uh, and also providing aid to the DPRK. They don't always go hand in hand in a real situation uh, because people, uh, the government take different approaches depending on what aspect 
project they're working on. So in that, given that uh, reality, what do you see for the role for North Korean studies? And also, uh, Professor, uh, so uh, Russia, for Russia's perspective, so Russia understands the DPRK well. And so from Russian perspective, what do you see as the future for the DPRK under the Kim Jong-un leadership? And Professor Chung, you mentioned that China has a lot of information on the DPRK. So right there, I envy you for that. And also, you mentioned that because of that, China is very careful in terms of its uh, approach, its policy towards the DPRK. Uh, so if you can elaborate on uh, more on why China needs to be careful, or specifically what area China needs to be particularly careful, that will be great. So and each panelist, if you can limit your uh, feedback to four to five minutes, that will be great. Once again, my question, you can take that as just the inspiration you don't have to feel obliged to directly answer my question. Dr. Town. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks to everyone for their comments. It's been, I think we've learned a lot from each other uh, this through this conversation. And, and as Artem said, it, it's good to see some old friends, um, especially since we're not able to travel right now. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, some interesting points have been brought up, and I want to give a little bit of background on Korea studies in America. Um, and I, I would start by saying, you know, similar to what Artem said, there isn't necessarily North Korea studies here. Um, it's mainly Korea studies. Um, and even that uh, is relatively limited, um, especially at the university level. And so a lot of East Asia studies programs in the US are really China, Japan focused and have either very little Korea, some don't have any Korea content, um, but the, the proliferation of Korea studies has really been more concentrated over the past you know, 20 years. Um, so now there are Korea studies programs and East Asia studies know that they have to include some kind of Korea component, but it has not been um, as popular or as prominent as China, Japan studies in the U.S. Um, and so as, as, uh, as John had mentioned as well, a lot of that has to do with concerted efforts from the Korean government to get more people in America to study about Korea um, and to start them young as well. And so without that uh, Korean government funding, um, there still would not be much Korea studies in the US. So obviously there's a lot more now than there used to be. It's still somewhat limited and it's very limited still on the North Korean aspect of it. Um, in DC, uh, you know, one of the things I talked about in my, in my speech, uh, or in my remarks is really, you know, if you look at the composition of who works on North Korea in DC, um, there is a very, uh, consistent profile minus me, <laughs> um, and maybe a couple of others. Um, but most of the people who work on North Korea in DC, especially in the senior level positions, all have a government background, whether it was CIA or State Department or NSC. Um, and so they, they bring that, that government perspective and government training and, and sort of biases with them as well as they continue to study North Korea in uh, either in the think tank sector or the private sector. And I do think that limits how Washington views North Korea. Um, so there is an over fixation on the security aspects um, because that's what Washington cares about, right? Like outside of the security aspects, North Korea is not of great interest to the Washington policy establishment. Of course, in the academic community, there's a little bit broader scope, but again, it's still somewhat limited um, and it is, a, it is an emerging field of study. Um, it is not a well-established field of study. I would say also that it's not just that government 
a background that drives the way Washington views um, or the way Washington treats North Korea. But again, there is also a funder aspect to this as well. Um, you know, in think tanks, we're always fundraising <laughs> and trying to find funding for research, no matter how interesting we think it is, we still need people to invest in it. Um, and so issues like WMD are the big sexy issues that everyone cares about and that, and that um, have the mainstream appeal and the, and the interdisciplinary appeal to funders, especially in the non-proliferation communities, um, in the arms control communities, um, in peace communities. Uh, but again, what we need now it, in order to change that narrative is also um, more funders that are willing to fund projects that aren't dealing with security issues, um, that are uh, more focused on gaining a better understanding of the North Korean system, the North Korean society, the, the social evolution, the political evolution, and how that factors into North Korea's long-term vision and evolution and strategic decision-making as well. And I think those are the aspects that are really understudied in the U.S. in general, especially in Washington. And part of that is a function of, um, of funding itself. And so I, I think there is, you know, obviously, again, now there's more people talking about North Korea because it does have the mainstream appeal. And as, as Dr. Zhang had mentioned, there are certainly a lot of people out there um, who have little knowledge of North Korea that are more non-proliferation people or, um, or who have very entrenched views about North Korea where they're not necessarily dealing with the context of today, but of the image that they have of North Korea. Um, and speculating based on on those biases, um, but you know, it's it is like I said, it is a good time to be working on North Korea because at least now people care. <laughs> um, there is funding, there is interest, um, there's growing demand for more information as well, and I think that creates a lot of new opportunities that didn't exist before. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so I guess we are running out of time for our last panelist, uh, Professor Chung. So other panelists, if you can uh, observe the time limit. And uh, next, prof Professor Hiraiwa Shunji. So in fact, in Japan, we don't have like clear uh, DPRK studies. Uh, we study the entire Korean Peninsula. Uh, but recently, well, I'm kind of uh, a part of the third generation of scholars. So we study North Korea and South Korea both. But at the same time, we think of North Korea separately uh, separate from South Korea, and we study South Korea separately from North Korea. So it's not that we don't have interest in North Korea. Uh, we do, uh, but we uh, are more mindful of South Korea. And also, uh, because uh, Korean studies is a part of regional region studies, so we look at the Korean Peninsula uh, itself, and the fact that the two Koreas are divided. That's an important uh, reason uh, why we want to understand the Korean Peninsula, an important aspect of our research. And also, we believe that uh, we need to have interest in South Korea as well, because South Korea has a big uh, influence, big impact on North Korea as well. So I think we cannot really separate uh, studying South Korea and North Korea. Regarding the next generation of researchers, fourth generation, if I can slightly touch upon that, again, uh, next generation scholars look at the entire Korean peninsula. And within that peninsula context, new researchers are trying to understand North Korea as North Korea and understand South Korea as South Korea. But once again, they are also uh, mindful of uh, significance that South Korea has towards North Korea. 
end regarding the Japanese and South Korean relations. Uh, I think uh, here, of course, uh, North Korea is an important factor. And uh, abduction is, of course, important issue. And And of course, because Japan and South Korea have, have different experiences with North Korea, it's understandable that South Korea and Japan have different uh, perception about North Korea. So, and also, but South Korea has a lot of information, accurate information about the DPRK. So from someone who is studying North Korea based in Japan, we would very much appreciate if South Korea can share more information with us. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Nielsen White. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think probably just on the issue of the tension between um, security and engagement, one thing that's probably worth stressing is that the UK government, particularly now, has tended to be particularly focused on the security dimension, um, particularly through its role in the UN Security Council in terms of support for sanctions. Um, that's partly a reflection, I think, of the priorities of the government um, and the immediacy of those security issues. Unlike Washington, where Korean specialists, as Jenny was pointing out, serve in government, we don't have the same sort of revolving door pattern of academics going into government, serving as special advisors. Um, that doesn't mean that the academic voice isn't heard. Uh, our foreign office, for example, routinely turns to experts for informal briefings. So there is an opportunity for us to present our view, but we're less engaged. That has one benefit, which is there is less professional incentivization to um, necessarily endorse the view of government as a means of seeing, seeing that as a route into a senior advisory position. So one could argue that there is perhaps more critical feedback and perhaps more objectivity. Um, it's worth also noting, I think, the extent to which, from the perspective of the DPRK, Britain has sometimes been seen, perhaps quite often seen, as a potential uh, informal intermediary. It was Tae Yong Ho, the former senior North Korean official who defected to South Korea, who has said, despite being a, a critic of the North, that he believed that there was a genuine interest in developing that relationship with the United Kingdom. It may have been based on a false premise that Britain had some influence, influence in Washington. Now, in contrast to the Cold War relationship where back in, of course, the 1950s, it was Harry Truman who was lobbied by the then British Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, to avoid escalation on the Korean Peninsula. That sort of influential role for the United Kingdom is arguably much less today, partly as a function of our diminishing influence. And I think an unwillingness, a lack of appetite on the part of senior British officials, including very senior politicians, to speak out against some of the shortcomings of American policy. At the height of fire and fury, our then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Theresa May, was notably muted in criticising the Trump administration's more provocative approach. Now, we shouldn't forget, of course, that there are some 8,000 British civilians in South Korea who would be exposed to any escalation of the risk of conflict between the two Koreas. So sometimes I think the British government is guilty of perhaps being um, too private and insufficiently candid in pointing out its criticisms. Um, when it comes to the academic community, I should also take this opportunity just to cite the role of new institutions in the UK. The University of Central Lancashire, for example, has developed a very active Korean studies programme with uh, new researchers from South Korea working, I think, at the forefront of developing new research in this area. And one advantage we have in the UK, UK to put it somewhat uh, provocatively, is our amateur tradition the sort of um, disciplinary demarcation lines that exist in the United States between departments of international relations and departments of history don't really operate. So we have a more fluid environment. And that I think means that you can see some of this sharing of interdisciplinary views between anthropologists, historians, and political scientists. All of that um, taking place in a context where, as I say, European think tanks are pushing the envelope in terms of track 1.5 and track two initiatives. I didn't mention the Scandinavians, but as I'm sure we're all aware, 
countries like Sweden have been at the forefront of reaching out to North Korea. More of that work, I think, needs to be emphasized because it, it feeds into government advice and it also helps to um, develop a network of connections with the North. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lukin. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 well, uh, I was asked about uh, the recent uh, trends uh, in uh, uh, Russia's uh, North Korea studies. Well, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, quite uh, similar to, uh, to what's happening uh, in the U.S. So uh, most of the people uh, in Russia who work on, on, on North Korea, they tend to do, you know, security and you know, geopolitics. Uh, non-proliferation um, issues, so this still very much uh, dominates uh, North Korea studies uh, in Russia. But uh, recently, uh, uh, there has also been some interesting uh, work uh, done on uh, on uh, the North Korean economy. So we have uh, uh, not not very many, but maybe a few uh, researchers uh, in Russia who. Or who are doing uh, uh, interesting work on uh, North Korea's economy, and Russia uh, does have some uh, advantage in this area, being a former uh, socialist, uh, you know, economy, and uh, having uh, carried out, you know, transition to some, you know, uh, uh, market uh, market um, economy. Uh, so I think Russia does have some uh, potential uh, in this area, in the area of you know uh, economic uh, research with regard to North Korea. And uh, responding to to the question uh, from the moderator about uh, Russia's uh, views on the future of North Korea, well, uh, Russia's official uh, view uh, uh, is that uh, North Korea's regime is very stable; that it's uh, here to stay for. Uh, for for a long term, or uh, uh, well, uh, I think that that's not surprising uh, uh, that uh, Russia has this view. But uh, I personally, uh, well, I am less convinced uh, about the stability of uh, of North Korea uh, as a state. Uh, so I think it's basically unpredictable, and as uh, Jenny. Uh, mentioned uh, very appropriately, uh, North Korea is a black box, and we just don't know what's happening inside. So you you could expect uh, virtually anything <laughs> to happen inside this black box. So uh, I would personally, I would not be surprised uh, if North Korea, you know, implodes literally tomorrow. I would not be surprised at all, frankly. But uh, there is uh, the equal likelihood that North Korea would continue for, for another seven decades. So that's equally possible. So uh, my frank answer would be, I just don't know what's going to happen to North Korea. But again, uh, I wouldn't uh, guarantee <laughs> its long-term existence. So not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then, Professor Chong, can you uh, give us a wrap-up comment? And uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that, that, that Jenny is the best one in DC and the USA now. Um, I, I, I I don't mean to to challenge her. I I want to I want to breathe with her. Yeah. Uh, 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 about the question what China should carefully handle with uh, uh, North Korea. I think one thing is that uh, if the relationship between China and North, North Korea, everything is good. That means everything may be bad. Because you don't know which part, which part of North Korea is good and which part is bad. You, you you do not know that, so you should be kind of kind of with the kind of with it very very care, carefully. Uh, just uh, for 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 my personal experience, I I wrote many uh, my many pieces and uh, uh, and uh, interviews. Mm, they not clear. Pro protest me. I, 
every time. Even I pleased, I pleased, I pleased it. He said, you, 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 you cannot see that. You, you should see, you should see like this, blah, blah, blah. Because we, just, just one person is like that for one government, for China, for China, for China government. It's the same thing because we share many things, just like the, 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 the root of the military, the party, and the government, we, we have the same one, but we have different views towards this, this so-called the same root. Because we have very, very different views so far. Because we, we cannot, just we can see about the China's character, characterized spatial socialism. They not said, no, we are not the same to you. We are different from you. Because we, you, you cannot see, see that. So we, we, we now, so from the economy, from the political and from the, 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 the characters, we cannot say, ah, oh, we are same and we are the similar one. No, you are you, are you. I am I. We are different, very, very different from you. Because we, 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 we showed, we, when we uh, just like the six, uh, several days ago, there is uh, something between China and uh, North Korea, the fishing boat, the, 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 the accident. We, we, cannot see, we cannot see anything because we, we don't know when, when we talk about the, the, the event itself, they will say, oh, you, you should keep the secrets because this is the secret between China and North Korea. So, oh, the best thing we can do is we say nothing about North Korea. And when we making the policy, when we make the policy, we should very, very carefully, yeah. Yes. And I want to say sorry to our in I'm now in Tibet. It's a high latitude. And now it's the, the weather is very good. But I wanted to say, say very, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, come, come, come. Yeah. Could you, Jugum, push me on the I know it's early in the morning, and thank you for joining us all the way from Tibet. Unfortunately, uh, we passed our allocated time, which was six. So the program uh, is uh, now over. But uh, Dr. Hong, could you be very brief? Well, thank you for all your comment. As I have mentioned, uh, the role of the government, especially Ministry of Unification, is critical. So the academia need to view Korean studies not as just one area of study, but we need to bridge different areas and different discipline all together. And I think I heard all of you when you said fundraising is important, and it's encouraging that we're seeing rise in um, interest in North Korea study. And I think that's meaningful, and it has a lot of implication. One thing I want to close on is some people, or in the past, many saw uh, Japan, uh, uh, many saw North Korea as uh, a rogue state, but we don't want to be biased. Uh, so we need an accurate diagnosis of North Korea and think about how we are going to deal with North Korea. With that, I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you. I believe security will continue to be an important issue. But if North Korea government can go beyond security issue, and if there are uh, positive development in other areas, it will be great. I know we, are, we have run out of time, so I had to rush into uh, the closing of this session. But before we close, I would like to thank all our participants. And next year, and a year before, before uh, year after, I hope that we can all meet together to have more extensive discussion. Thank you for your participation.